welcome guys uh, now let us talk about uh, the bacterial meningitis and whenever we are talking about meningitis especially the causative when, when uh, bacteria are the causative agent of meningitis the three major type of bacteria strain come to our mind first and those strains are one is the strep streptococcus pneumoniae and then Neisseria meningitis and then the Haemophilus influenzae and three major strains that causes uh, this bacterial meningitis most of the cases so let us do this uh, kind of structure again so let's put this x axis and y axis now this x axis will be putting the approximate uh, prevalence of the disease in percentage so let's say this is a 10 20 30 40 so percentage of disease 50 and 60 so let's say 60 uh, up to 60 percent we put it okay and here now we'll be seeing the percentage of the disease now the first case the highest causing uh, agent for this kind of bacterial meningitis is streptococcus pneumoniae so let me put it here is among uh, approximately 50 percent of these diseases are caused by streptococcus pneumoniae so here it is streptococcus pneumoniae pneumonia okay and then uh, the second one of this zone is Neisseria meningitis it can cause approximately 32 to 34 percent of the disease so let us put here Neisseria meningitis or N meningitis there are other Neisseria stains causing different diseases Menin, but this meningitis this strain causes meningitis and the third one here will be Haemophilus influenzae or Haemophilus influenza, whatever. So let's put here Haemophilus influenzae. Influenzae. Okay. These are the three. Uh, these are the three important bacterial strains that are causing bacterial meningitis. Okay. So I must put here percentage prevalence prevalence okay okay now among all of them uh, among this kind of bacterial meningitis one thing is very important is that this meningitis is a disease of brain this is a disease of brain and central nervous system or CNS it's due to any kind of uh, mis cognition and miscommunication between nervous system cells and nerve cells like neurons and as a result of that our personality getting altered and kind of brain is getting damaging right so that's the different symptoms of meningitis usually right in all this meningitis we are seeing that this this disease causing agents are uh, the pathogens or the residual pathogen of our respiratory tract most of the cases are of respiratory mucosa or respiratory tract. Now, now usually all of them that have told that they are uh, the normal. Uh, call, so usually the colonization begins with begins in respiratory tract, respiratory tract or respiratory mucosa. Now, from this respiratory mucosa, they start to move, and finally, when they reach the blood stream when they reach the blood stream in those case they start to thrive and they finally reach brain they finally reach a brain and whenever they reach brain after a certain time when they reach the brain they'll start causing damages to the brain and also what we can see is that they can also move to central nervous central nervous system okay or CNS okay so when they move to CNS or brain in those cases they will damage them and as a result of that it will lead to the development of certain kind of symptoms and the symptoms are let's say the symptom is a light phobia or photophobia so let me write as a photophobia okay Photophobia. The individual uh, treated with this kind of infections, uh, those person uh, develop a kind of photophobia. So phobia when they look at light, right? And they can also cause. Usually, we can know that this is CNS damage or brain damage, brain damage, and change in 
बिहेवियर सो ऑल्टर्ड बिहेवियर बिहेवियर राइट सो नो ऑल दिस आर द सिम्टम्स ऑफ मेन इंजाइटिस ओके नाउ दिस दिस फर्स्ट वन इज अप्टोकॉकस न्यूमोनी which is a sole causative agent for above 50% of the meningitis infections now in this case they can be uh, transferred from uh, the nasal droplets from 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 mucosa mucosa of one person to another person like that now this kind of infection can be of endogenous or exogenous so let me write about this streptococcus pneumoniae this can be of endogenous so pneumonia pneumonia it is again another important agent for causing pneumonia so pneumonia pneumonia i hope this is the pneumonia spelling anyways now this pneumonia uh, can cause the disease by two different means one is the endogenous endogenous and second one is the exogenous right endogenous and exogenous right now endogenous means this disease is carried by a carrier who is a uh, developed uh, who has developed a kind of resistant to particular type of uh, this bacteria now the exogenous means this particular type of uh, bacteria are spread via nasal droplet nasal droplet droplets okay so usually via the droplets from the airway nasal droplets via so let me write via airway 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 via airway of our nasal region it will uh, cause uh, form in droplets and they will be released outside and then the carrier from the carrier normal indiv individual will get this and they will start in uh, this infection okay so this is a normal kind and then it will be spread to cns and brain it will start damaging those regions okay and endogenous means this is present in uh, the individual but uh, who impaired the resistance this kind of organism against against a certain limit okay and this kind of infection caused by streptococcus pneumoniae are very much prevalent in uh, adult human being very common in adult human being very rare in infants okay now the second causative agent for that is neisseria meningitis which is another very very important causative agent for that now again this kind of neisseria meningitis uh, kind of pneumonia infection is spread via again the nasal droplet Uh, from one individual to another individual from the carrier to another individual okay and finally after the development of the disease in brain and cns it will result in it can be result in coma for a very long period of time right now if this infection occurs and it evade through it evade through our immune system and finally it provide it inside our brain it will result in high fever malaria and it will lead to headache rigid of neck rigidity of neck vomiting and sensibility to light we, which we have already talked about here but it also results in this coma and coma will set place set place within hours that is very very dangerous here coma will set place within hours and then this uh, meningitis is uh, very very common between 2 to 18 years of age this neisseria meningitis is infection is very common between 2 to 18 years of age so this one actually causing uh, the infection in children in children so between 2 to 18 years so it will this kind of infection is very much predominant right now let us talk about the third kind which is a hemophilus influenza type of infection now you know that hemophilus influenza is a kind of again it's a normal resident of our human upper respiratory tract so this is a kind of opportunistic pathogen here so let me this is a kind of opportunistic oppor sorry opportunistic opportunistic kind of pathogen which resides in upper respiratory tract for for normal purposes but for after some time it will spread from there into the nasal mucosa or respiratory mucosa and then this infection can be of systematic and then can evade through the blood stream and finally it will reach this cns or central nervous system and then they will start damaging the central nervous system start damaging the brain and it will cause disease and this hemophilus influenza predominantly cause diseases in newborn and infants that is another very very tragic condition 
it causes this kind of infection so let me take this color and show you so it causes this kind of infection in a newborn or infants okay it causes the infection in infants and also uh, in this kind of infection uh, they uh, they they start to uh, they are also having the capsular region which is made up with glycocalyx layer that's why they can also evade through immune system pretty clearly but still uh, nowadays there is a vaccine available for the hemophilus influenza and the vaccine we are talking about is made with it's made with uh, the subunit vaccine so it's a kind of subunit vaccine subunit vaccine made up with made up from from the glyco calyx layer it is from the glycopolysaccharide layer polysaccharide which is a carbohydrate layer right so glycopolysaccharide layer so we bring the glycopolysaccharide break the glycopolysaccharide layer and take a part of it and then we convert it and make a, a vaccine against uh, with it not against it with with it against this uh, bacteria hemophilus influenzae and what we can do here that this this glycopolysaccharide layer that we've taken there are many varieties of the layer depending upon the type of bacterial strain it can be type uh, it can it can be of different types type a b usually type b is taken which give rise to very very important and very what we can say immunogenic much more immunogenic immunogenic condition that's why we take this type b uh, polysaccharide layer fragment and we convert them into the subunit vaccine and we can administer this vaccine for longer period of time uh, we can take it uh, for our uh, purpose and then this kind of vaccine or the development of this vaccine results in uh, this vaccine results in uh, less uh, susceptibility of this disease less uh, outbreak of the disease in united states after introducing it right so that's about the bacterial meningitis and i hope that's helpful uh, oh let i forget to mention about uh, the treatment so so sorry so let's talk about the treatment a little bit now common treatment is uh, treatment is very much necessary for the bacterial meningitis otherwise it will set into coma and finally the patient will die in hours if we won't treat this kind of situation so for the rapid treatment what we need to do we need to remove the, the those those uh, bacteria from the stream from the bloodstream especially for that reason what we can use many of these bacteria are resistant kind of bacteria they are we cannot use a general kind of penicillin treatment and all these things even some of them are resistant against penicillin g also so what we need to use we need to use third generation cephalosporins so we'll be used sorry we'll be used cephalosporins cephalosporins now among cephalosporins what we can use here we can use cefotaxim can use cefotaxim and also we can use ceftriaxone we can use ceftriaxone we can use both of them together okay and also we can use another type of antibiotic which is vancomycin vancomycin to finally treat this kind of infections okay so that's uh, about it but we need to take care of this situation pretty fast pretty quick otherwise we need to be very very quick in this case otherwise we may lose the patient right so keep this thing in mind uh, i want to close this lecture thank you